Well, welcome everyone to uh, an author, uh, yet another Authors at Google talk. Uh, my name is John Orwant, I'm with uh, Google Research, and I have the pleasure and the honor today of introducing someone who, in my opinion, is one of the foremost writers of our, of our generation. Um, I say foremost writer and not foremost science fiction writer or foremost hard science fiction writer, in part because of a class I took about uh, 15 or 20 years ago from uh, AI pioneer Marvin Minsky. Um, the discussion kind of strayed to modern, modern literature, and he talked about what it was that he liked to read. And he said that when it came to fiction, he only read science fiction. He never read anything else. That was the only genre that he read. And people would occasionally kind of call him on this and say, you know, don't you feel like that makes you narrow, right, only reading this one genre? And his reply, I remember to this day, which was, no, I'm not the one being narrow. You're the one being narrow, because all of what you call regular literature, that's just about the seven deadly sins. Science fiction is about everything else. And I can't think of um, another living writer who better encompasses that notion of science fiction being about everything else than our guest today, uh, who has an unparalleled ability to kind of envision the intersection of culture and environment um, in a way that kind of uh, paints a world in, in very high resolution. Now, that said, his latest book, Shaman, is not really science fiction. In fact, it's about the seven deadly sins. It's a coming of age story of a young man. Um, and if I just stopped my description there, I think most science fiction aficionados wouldn't want to read the book. Um, but then you hear it's by a science fiction author and you think, okay, well maybe it's a coming of age story of someone you know, on a, on a distant planet that's very different from our planet. You know, that, that would kind of be in, the, uh, in, in our author's style. Or maybe it's 300 years in the future, like his latest book, the uh, book before this one, 2312. Or maybe it's about a coming of age story of a robot. Um, it's not any of those things. I think to some extent it's kind of, it's easy to write the typical science fiction novel, because if you're talking about a distant planet or someplace that's in the future, you can make stuff up, right? No one's gonna be able to call you on it. Um, instead, this book is about our planet uh, in the past, and it's not a Civil War romance. Uh, the past is 32,000 years ago in the Upper Paleolithic. It's the story of a uh, Cro-Magnon, uh, and this is at a time when the Cro-Magnons were uh, living with, with, with Neanderthals. Um, and the author really kind of had to do a whole lot of research, and I'm looking forward to kind of learning about the research that he did uh, to get this book, because um, this book is it's going to be a hit, and it's going to be poured over by archaeologists, by sociologists, by anthropologists, by historians, by linguists, to figure out if he really got everything right. Because I guarantee you, after you read this book, you know, when you think about, um, when you think about Cro-Magnons, right, the images that are going to pop into your head are going to be the images that are painted here. So uh, our guest today has uh, won a Hugo Award, he's won a Nebula Award, he's won the John Campbell Memorial Award, he's won the Locus Award, he's won the uh, World Fantasy Award, um, some of those awards more than once. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Kim Stanley Robinson. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna use this, I believe, yeah. Um, so thank you very much, John, for that kind introduction. Um, and I will say that this book, Shaman, is one that I consider to be uh, science fiction because without the science of archaeology, uh, we wouldn't know what I'm writing about here. So um, I'm going to read two brief passages, and these are specifically chosen for uh, Google. This is my uh, fifth time at Google and the first time that I've come to read you all a book. Uh, before that, it's been uh, different kinds of conferences. And so this actually, for me, is kind of fun to uh, finally get to read to this crowd. And these are the two uh, Google Earth passages from this book. Uh, the first one should only last about five minutes, and the second one also about five minutes. And then I want to hear questions, and I'll talk more about the process of doing this book. So OK, here's the first passage. And, and this is, you have to imagine, uh, uh, essentially kind of a Burning Man festival 30,000 years ago. Um, uh, Central Europe, summer day. In fact, the 8-8 festival, which would be, you know, August 8th. 
On the morning of the last day, he and Elga and Lucky went to the broad sandy bank of the Meadows River where there was a group of men in the sun busy at work on their bird's eye views. As always, it was mostly an old man's game, and the more they had wandered in their lives, the better they were at it, and the more interested. It was a traveler's game. Now, a lot of old men and a few old women, maybe two score in all, were strolling about watching those who were actively making views. The makers crouched and tiptoed about on the edges of their patches, stretching far out to smooth and shape the sand to what they thought some part of the world would look like from the sky if shrunk to the size of their patch. The areas they portrayed were sometimes big, extending from the festival grounds and the caribou step to the mountains to the south and the great salt sea to the west. Others portrayed smaller areas. There were distinct styles, which Loon thought were somewhat like the way wall paintings were either three liners or fully detailed. Some views were made simply of wet sand molded into the shapes of the land by hand and stick so that one saw them stripped flesh of the land, so to speak. Others used moss for meadows, twigs for trees, pebbles shoved into the sand to look like the gleam of water seen from on high, even some little toy animals and shelters and people taken from kids' camp games. Someone had even packed down snow to represent the ice caps on the central highlands, and in one old woman's view, even the great ice wall of the north, here ankle high. It was funny to see these little worlds as if one were an eagle at the highest point of its gyre, and some of the decorated views were quite beautiful. But what the makers mostly discussed was how accurate they were. Long sticks were used to point out features. Traveling stories were related with lots of argument about what a day's walk meant in terms of a stretch of land. This last argument was impossible to resolve, both in principle and in relation to the shrinking they had done to reduce a big part of the earth to three strides on a side but it obviously gave many of them immense pleasure to discuss it at length with sand hills and canyons to point to. I was in this valley you mark as shallow, but it's deeper than that. I passed through its 12th month and the sun never came out over the southern ridge, so you need to have it deeper. Maybe so, here, I'll scoop it down a bit. And so on. At the end of the session, they would all declare their favorites and a best of day would be declared and the winner given a bucket of mash and a chance to brag for a fist or two. And then they would all stand around the edges of the view observers and maker both, and leap out onto the little worlds and trample them to a chaos of torn sand worse than the mud at a caribou ford. Gods destroying worlds, and while it lasted, it was the best dance of all. They shouted and laughed as they leaped and kicked. It felt glorious. So we can discuss this later, but I want to point out to you that um, the Ohlone in Native Americans, the Ohlone that lived on this very Bay Area, um, did this very thing uh, for uh, European visitors who came to, first came to the Bay Area. So although it's speculation on my part, I'm sure that this actually was happening back in that time. Now here again, um, the last... Um, the last piece that I'll read for you today is, is about the same lake that is another, um, well, it's a traveler's tale. Uh, you have to imagine a night by the fire, just an ordinary night by the fire, but a traveler has come by. I am a traveler, as you know. I walk the surface of Mother Earth, and so do my fellow travelers, each of us on his own path. And some of us repeat our paths as long as we can find them, and nothing makes us take a different way. I'm one of those myself, having a wife with my brother, and he goes out when I'm at home, and he doesn't like it when I'm overly late, although both of us have been delayed once or twice through the years. What this means for me is I go out east to the gate between worlds and then turn north and walk for a fortnight right up to the edge of the great ice cap and come back just under that great white wall or sometimes up on the ice itself if the summer melt has made the land next to the ice impassable. West I return and south across the steps to home using paths of my own that no one knows, the best ways of all. That's the way it is for me, but in my travels I meet other men out walking the world and some of them have neither circuit nor home but wander always a new way. These men are curious people, odd in their ways and speech, and, but interesting for that, and we talk. Always when travelers get together over a fire, we talk. You can see that right now, I know. And travelers together talk about traveling. Where have you been? What have you seen? What are the people like? What's out there on this world we live on? These are the questions we ask and the stories we tell. And some travelers travel to find the answers and tell new stories to those they meet. One such I met this summer at the farthest east of all the places I go. This man looked like the northers, and I could barely understand him, but I could and it got easier as we talked, because he had only one thing to talk about, which was this world we live on, its shape and size. 
all travelers agree, for we've seen it ourselves. There is ice to the north wherever you go, and to the west is the great salt sea, and to the south, again the salt sea, although warmer and more calm, more in and out, and dotted with islands. We all agree on this, we travelers, as between us we've seen it all, and some travelers claim to have seen it all themselves alone. Good, maybe they are even telling the truth, I can't say. But here's the thing, what about east? This northern man was like a lot of us. He had that question, and more than that, he wanted to know the answer, and no one had it. So he took off walking east, he said. He walked for days, he walked for months, he walked for years. He walked east from the time this question had come to him in his youth and kept on walking until he was a man in the middle of life. Seventeen years, he said, he walked east. I asked him what he had seen on this life walk. He told me of steps that went on forever. And there were mountains like those to the west of here, and some lakes bigger than any I've seen, little salt seas even. Their water was salt, he said, but mostly it was steps. You know what that's like. The walking is good if it isn't too wet, and there are always animals to eat. So there really was no impediment to him. Yet there he sat across a fire from me, as far to the east as I had ever been, but it was only the gate of worlds, a nice broad pass between low mountains to north and south. It had taken him 12 years to walk back to where we were. This he told me. Finally, I had to ask him, why did you come back? Having gone so far, why turn around? Why not keep going for the rest of your life? He stared into the fire for a long, long time before he met my eye and answered me. When I was as far east as I got, he said, I came to a hill and went up it to look. I was feeling poorly and my feet hurt, and no person I had met for several years spoke any word I understood. All my dealings were done by sign, and you can do that and still get by, but after a while you want a word with the people you see. I, Pippi, could only agree to that. And so, he said, he stood on that hill, and all to the east was just the same. There was no sign at all it would ever change. I realized, he said, that this world is just too big. You can't have it all, no matter how much you want it. It's bigger than any man can walk in one life. Possibly it just keeps going on forever. Possibly our Mother Earth is round, he said then, like a pregnant woman or the moon, and if you walked long enough, you would come around to where you started, assuming the Great Salt Sea did not stop you, but really there is no way to know for sure. And so I turned back, he said, because the world is too big, and most of all, I wanted to talk to somebody again before I died. Having said that, having told his tale, we stood and hugged, and he cried so hard I thought he would choke. I had to hold him up. Whether he had succeeded or failed in his life walk, he did not know, and I didn't either. After that, he calmed down, and we looked at the fire until long in the night, telling other stories we knew. And before bed, I asked him, so what's for you now? What will you do now that you're back? Well, he said, to tell the truth, I'm thinking I may take off east again. Thank you. Google Earth, 30,000 BC, or before present. And those are only the most uh, momentarily relevant of the uh, 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 speculative passages in this book as to trying to think out um, how the people of that time knew their worlds, given the, um, the limited ability that they had to comprehend what they were up to. Uh, and the limited ability they had to pass on what they learned because there was no writing. And this was the crucial thing. This is, a, this is a, a human beings, the same DNA as us, uh, very accomplished. The only DNA difference is that a lot of us have lactose tolerance and none of them did. Otherwise, they're, they're us, but they didn't have writing, and writing is very much of a consciousness-changing uh, technology, very much so. Maybe even more than the internet, which is another mm, possibly major consciousness-changing activity. We don't know yet. So I w had to get into the world of the, uh, the preliterate, the oral mind, where there's, there must be, I don't know, 30 poems in the book, but they're not poetry in the modern sense, but rather just information. There's also probably a hundred proverbs in the book, another way that people could hold on to what had been learned and pass it along. It's, it, was a, it was an ear culture, and it was about remembering. So.
Um, and it's about the cave paintings, um, uh, especially the Chauvet Cave. Those of you who have had the joy of seeing Werner Herzog's most recent film, The Cave of Forgotten Dreams, you have already seen the um, visual uh, illustration of this book of mine because I wrote about the people who painted that cave. And that's why it's 32,000 years ago, because that's when that cave was painted. Um, and I think that's all, all I need to tell you, um, you know, right here, all I want to tell you right here at the start before I get some questions to direct me into talking about other parts of it. And I can go on without them, but uh, I would love to have questions to direct me to areas of interest. So, so when you, um, so you found the setting from the, uh, the caves. Um, how did you settle on a, uh, you can tell this is a question from a, an author wannabe, on, on the arc, what was going to happen? Did you sort of just start off and let it happen, decide when it was done, or did you know where you were going? Well, that's a good question for everybody. Um, the other stimulus for me in the writing of this book was the discovery of the Iceman between the glacier, uh, between Austria and Italy in 1991, who had been frozen in the glacier with all of his gear. And his gear was remarkably similar to the backpacking gear that I take when I go up in the Sierras. And uh, it, it proved that they were a high-tech culture. His gear was uh, uh, magnificent and, and came from about 60 different sources and a wide region. It took a full culture to make the gear that this guy had. And so I thought, well, let's look into the archaeology and find out a storyline that, could, uh, that would not be just a wanderer like the Iceman or like the traveler that tells his tale, but would allow me to get to the heart of their culture. And the things I was interested in was, how did science begin in its true beginnings? And how did art begin? And it turns out that at that time, really, these were not identical efforts. They never have been. But the, the herb woman, the herb women who were uh, essentially the med doing medicine, um, they were really the first scientists. Uh, trial and error, what, uh, take something, see what effect it has on you. It, it was very rough and ready because they didn't have much in the way of uh, 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 ability to differentiate the effects from the causes. Um, but nevertheless, that was the first science, really. And then the first art seems to be this um, associated with these caves and with the shamanistic religion. Uh, that's one of two uh, competing theories as to what those cave paintings are about. And they sort of supersede the first guess that it was hunting magic. The, the hunting magic theory has gone away. And what it's been replaced by is that it was a shamanistic religion or it was uh, teenagers, probably teenage boys, screwing around and doing graffiti on a dare, scaring themselves and doing a, a pornography and, uh, and graffiti. And you know, the paintings, there's a lot of incompetent and beginner um, uh, cave art that doesn't get reproduced in the art books and the Herzog films. So I think both theories are possibly true and are not in competition with each other. But the, the absolute expertise uh, of the the big good paintings that you see, and the fact that in Lascaux they're on the ceilings, and as Gary Snyder put it, there needed to be an arts administration in the Paleolithic to get the scaffolding together to build those, uh, to, to get the artists that high on the ceiling, suggests that we're really in something quite professional here. So by telling the story of a shaman, I could tell the story of the whole culture. And if he was associated with an herb woman and they did medicine together so that you had the mind-body uh, effect, and then you could talk about both. And since it, all these uh, relationships were being passed along master to apprentice, then if I had an apprentice, then I would have essentially portrait of the artist as a young man. I would have the Bildungsroman a classic form, a young man, and maybe he's good at some parts of it, but not good at other parts of it. So that uh, he, maybe he likes the painting, but it has a poor memory, uh, especially for poetry, which I myself have a terrible memory for poetry. I could relate to that. So slowly but surely, by the, the desire to show the whole culture, a character begins to develop, or some relationships begin to develop. And then you do need a plot. I mean, I think novels are about daily life. They're about, you know, how did people live back then? But if it only was that, it would become anthropology. And you need a, 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 a plot where essentially daily life gets broken and something else happens. Well, I didn't want to impose anything particularly modern. I didn't want to say, 
although this is not a bad idea, have a murder mystery that the shaman had to solve. I mean, this would be the typical imposition. You know, we have a Roman, uh, we have medieval monk detectives, we have Roman detectives. I could have a Paleolithic detective. I'm glad I didn't go that way. Um, but if you have different kinds of culture, um, in the, many of the oldest stories that we have out of the prehistoric literature have to do with intra-tribal conflicts, including uh, people kidnapped and stolen from one tribe by another. And at that point, you've got a, an, an extremely intense situation, uh, more intense even than the murder mystery, which is kind of NCI forensic, and I can't tell you how sick I am of that scenario. So, so that was how I went about it, the building of it. And it, was, it, it's, it sounds fairly um, um, Tinker Toy or Rector said, it sounds fairly uh, rational, and, and it is. But there, at a certain point, what one would hope is that it begins to take over and it begins to come to life. And it's essentially kind of Calvin and Hobbes. At some point, Hobbes had better wake up and start doing his part of things. And at that point, you've got a book on your hands. Yeah. You, you mentioned the Ohlone as a culture um, that inspired the book. What other cultures did you look at for inspiration on how people would relate to each other and what their beliefs may be and stuff like that? Well, uh, I looked at almost all of the, the um, what we used to call Stone Age cultures that were still functioning when we got there, but especially um, the Australian Aborigines, um, the Inuit and the Athapascans, because I was in an ice uh, scenario and I wanted to go north into the polar regions and see how people live there. So the Athapascans of Alaska were really important, partly because they had such a good anthropologist visit them early on. And so the information was really rich. Then also, the, everybody has to look at the Bush people or the Kung, um, because they, they were such a high functioning um, and so suggestive. And they were so well studied and still out there. And those were the main, and then every, all North American tribes, like I would just get anthologies of, of Native American poetry and proverbs. Um, but the, I would say uh, really the Athapascans, the Inuit, and the, and the Aborigines were probably the three main. And so you understand that I'm doing all this by analogy backwards. And I'm saying that these are cultures that were basically studied in the 19th century. And it isn't clear that they weren't disturbed by modernity before they were studied, or that the anthropologists got things wrong. What I'm assuming is that if we were doing it, uh, if, if it looks like people were doing it um, 10,000 years ago, that they were doing it 30,000 years ago, that there was that kind of continuity. So. This is something that no archaeologist, no self-respecting archaeologist can say, uh, can make these kind of speculative leaps. And in fact, it's really against the rules now in the hardcore archaeology to the point where they don't like this shame and interpretation of the cave paintings. They're saying, this is such a guess. We can't possibly know. Let's just concentrate on what we can know. And of course, that really cuts a lot of stuff out. But when you're doing a novel, you don't have to worry about that. So uh, how did you decide? Um in my world, you know, 30,000 years ago, they were not doing that yet. How did you decide? Was it driven by the story or driven by you believe what's likely to have happened? It was driven by, first by uh, what did I think was happening and, and guided by the archaeologists. I didn't have, um, I, they don't have bow and arrows in this book. I mean, that's part of, um, uh, that's what the archaeologists say, that bow and arrows are relatively recent, maybe six or 7,000 years. I, Happily, as um, John pointed out, the Neanderthal were there 32,000 years ago. That's pretty solid. Uh, and they were domesticating wolves into dogs around that time, which we used to say was 15,000 years ago. And now the genetic evidence pushed it back to like more like 40,000, which made it, or 30. It was, in other words, right in my time. And so they had spear throwers, but not bow and arrow. And uh, what I was saying is they for sure had snowshoes, although. Everything that they made out of leather or straw or even wood has rotted away in 30,000 years. We got nothing but stone, bone, ivory, uh, tooth, and um, shell, and the cave paintings. So our evidence for 30,000 years ago is so slight that I, I, in other words, I tried to be only as conservative as would keep an archaeologist from being completely tossed out of the book. 
Uh, but other than that, saying, uh, like, like, did they know about the, did they suspect that the Earth was round? Did they know about the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and the ice cap? Were they, how geographically centered were they? Were, they can't, nobody can say no to me. But it's a matter of speculation because we have no evidence whatsoever. We do know that there are cultures that have some objects that come from over a thousand miles away. But whether they got traded five miles at a time or whether there were people doing it the whole way, nobody can say. It's a nice open slate in that regard. Um, in doing your research, um, what were some things that were like kind of concrete that surprised you um, that you learned? Well, we see evidence that they were already, um, although they were pre-literate, they were beginning to keep records and mark things. So that did surprise me. That's um, a journalist who got interested named Marshak, sort of made himself into an archaeologist by writing what was supposed to be a popular science book. But he, he found all the evidence in the literature and in the record that people were marking bones. And every 28 or 29 days, uh, there was an extra loop. So it looked like they were marking the months. And the months, of course, are marked by the moon. So there's no need to know where you are in a month because the moon is telling you in the sky every night. And it's like a giant clock. But the discrepancy between the solar year and the lunar year is, is uh, irreconcilable um, by direct observation. Um, you can get pretty good, but not very good. And so it looks like people were trying to figure out, here we got these lunar months, so convenient, big clock in the sky. But then the sun going to the solstices, the equinox and the solstices again, are offset. Well, what's with that? And it looks like people, at least 40,000 years ago, were trying to keep track so that they might be able to reconcile it. That was, I thought that was beautiful. It's kind of a Stonehenge thing. It's kind of a computer thing. And, and the evidence is there to make that case. Also, the Iceman had tattoos. <laughs> that cracked me up. Uh, so I had the uh, good fortune to have an, have an advanced copy of your book. And in that book, um, there was no preface. There was no foreword. I don't know if that's the case in the, in the actual no, book no, as people no, can no, go no, no, no. Terrible idea. And so, I mean, one of the things that I enjoyed as a result of that kind of lack of context, just being kind of thrust into the story, is I, I was, in a sense, reading kind of two stories, right? There was the arc of the story that you told, but there was also this meta-mystery to me of trying to figure out when this was taking place and where this was taking place. And there was a, a particular point at which, you know, you have, uh, you have the main character refer to a particular river. Right. right. And I then Googled that, and Google spell corrected it into the actual name of the river today. And so then I, sp I basically kind of from a third of the book on, I was reading the book with Wikipedia on the side, slowly piecing things together. Um, and, you know, and eventually kind of ending up being able, you know, you know feeling like, I had this, this euphoric moment where I had kind of cracked the mystery of where this was taking place and what was happening. Uh, was that intentional? I like that. I, I, that's what I think should happen in the reading process. And I put in clues. Um, you know, the, there's a, um, a, a stone arch across the river in my local people. It's very prominent right next to their camp. They live in Loop Meadow, which is an oxbow that's dried out. And the oxbow dried out because the river cut through a bit of that limestone cliff and left an arch. Well, for early peoples, that arch, they call it the stone bison in my book because it kind of looks like a bison uh, straddling the river. A very extraordinary feature that is at Vallon Pont d'Arc, um, a famous little tourist spot in the Ardèche in France. And so between, uh, and also, these words are so ancient. The Basque is an ancient language. Proto-Indo-European is an ancient language. Um, I, because of the translation stuff you can find online now, I was able to um, uh, use those things and, and leave clues like that. And I would have hated a preface or the jacket copy or you know, the notorious trolls, which is really the nicest thing I can say about them at Kirkus Reviews. There's a, there's a book review service called Kirkus, which is uh, prides itself on its, on its malevolence and, and, and um, 
I won't say anything nasty here, but the review of Shaman was suggesting that there be maps and a glossary and a bibliography and all this. But this was a, a clearly someone uh, aggressively, passive aggressively or flat out aggressively, trying to attack its reality as a novel. And, and so, luckily, I, I'm being published by a wonderful editor at a wonderful publisher, and they're completely on board with um, doing it my way. And, I do, and no, I love it. Let's, you know, that you can find out where this all is without having the outside information. For this book and uh, for the Mars books, you needed to, to do a lot of research uh, and fill in details. And then in one case, you were working forward and the other one uh, uh, working backwards. How was that different? They're remarkably similar. Um, the, the, and the interesting thing is that um, the amount, the Mars literature in English, if gathered and put on a bookshelf, I can tell you for a fact, when I was writing the book anyway, which is really the late 80s, early 90s, is about two bookshelves worth of material. Now, the literature about the Paleolithic is, a, is somewhat bigger, but not stupendously bigger. It's about four bookshelves worth of books. And so I, I also had that library on hand. And I would contrast this, and Antarctica, um, maybe just one bookshelf worth of material for my Antarctic novel, and then the years of rice and salt where I did this alternative history where all the Europeans died in the Black Death and then the world went on for 700 years um, differently with the Europeans gone, um, that was, uh, you know, a, a 25 years of gathering books and that essentially was infinite. There was no end to the amount of books I could read to try to figure out what world history would have been like without the Europeans and it was kind of a carte blanche when I went in to use bookstore say, oh, you mean the Chinese went to Africa on these uh, gigantic sailing ships in the 14th century? Great, I'll buy that. And uh, that indeed turned out to be crucial. Other things turned out to be completely irrelevant, but I had two or three bookcases of books assembled for uh, the years of rice and salt and, and, um, and I essentially crashed my system. You know, my brain broke. I, I couldn't, it, it was like a drop in the ocean to do research for that one. So the other ones have felt much more manageable, you, much more like you have a, a secure topic, you can give yourself a um, little graduate degree type education very quickly, and the more you do it, the better you get at it, because you have the, con the context, the tools, the ability to rip a book, and sometimes I felt like I could uh, touch the spine of a book and, and uh, immediately know its entire contents um, by, by telepathy um, when I was hungry enough. Uh, so. Prehistory and, and Mars, the cool thing about it is that we, have, we do have a lot of the culture of the Paleolithic because of those paintings and because of the decoration and because archaeology has given us more. Mars was more uh, speculative and I had to make up more things myself and no one person should have to make up a culture. That's why science fiction cultures always look so thin. It's a, it's a group effort, a civilizational effort to make up a culture and so when one person tries to imitate it, you have to um, uh, try to uh, uh, suggest that there's much more than the things that you're telling by a kind of magic, a stage magic trick. And I'm, I've perfected that, but it's hard. And it's not as fun as having a whole culture with giving you all of its good stuff, which I knew that for sure when I went to Antarctica. I went to Antarctica and there's this hilarious culture down there that I didn't have to invent, but was just giving itself to me. It was wonderful. I want to I want to go back to uh, the Minsky topic and science fiction. Sure. And the reason I'm going to do this is because I have a very good friend of mine. She just published her, her first novel. She's very young. She's fl flirting already with science, with uh, Rosalind Franklin and you know, like DNA. Mm -hmm. And but but I feel that she's she may feel that you know like science fiction, like a lot of people feel. I mean, she wouldn't be the only one. Uh, that science fiction sort of boxes you in mm -hmm. and you're a science fiction writer and then you have an audience like here where there's see maybe one woman mm -hmm. in the audience and what do you have to say to budding writers who who may be afraid of you know like going into science fiction be right. because of these reasons and you know like maybe expand on that Minsky story well, thank you for that question. Um, uh, I think that science fiction is the realism of our time, 
and yet um, there are many uh, dedicated readers who will never read it because they don't think they like or understand science fiction. Um, I, if I had a blackboard here, and thank God I don't, I would say that all of the genres have the potential for great literature and great stories, but uh, a timeline will de de describe what's going on. Say that it, you've got um, uh, the beginning of writing, so that's say 3000 BC or 2000 BC, and the line goes right up to the present. So everything on that line is a, a, a genre that can be divided up between what we would call mainstream or, or the, the literature of now, which is within, say, 30, 40 years of the present moment. And then before that, it's, it's historical fiction, which has a big spread, but not an infinite spread. It's only just the 3,000 years of literate history, and that's historical fiction, great genre. Now, science fiction are, is always about the history that we cannot know. So in, it's the future, which we never can know. So it's like, at that point, it gets to be a spread, like a weather scenario spread, where the future could go in many different directions. Then alternative history, if you postulate that something different happened in the past and goes off to the side, we can never know what that would be. And so that's another unknown history. And then before history began, human beings were doing their thing for these 30, 40,000 years, prehistorical literature. But we can't really know it, because it's not written down, and we're working by inference, as I did here. So science fiction is the history that we can't know. And that's why alternative histories and even prehistoric fiction are very often filed in the science fiction section. That's the logical underpinning of the genre. And then fantasy isn't on the timeline at all, especially Tolkien fantasy. It has a different history of its own. It's in a bubble of its own. And as soon as you have my, my schema, then you can say, well, dang, I'm going to put a, a fantasy novel right into the historical timeline. And, Coleridge is going to run into a bunch of magicians with real magic, and that's um, you know, uh, historical fantasy, Tim Powers. Then someone says, well, I'm going to say that in the sewers of New York right now, there's magicians running around. That's urban fantasy, a lot of that. And so you can see that this, um, this uh, schema begins to slot the genres. But this gets to the next part of your question. As a young writer, or as a reader, what do you do? Uh, you're going to get pigeonholed by your first success. The marketers and the publisher and the bookstores are going to want to put you somewhere. So um, it's an open question where you want to be put, uh, where you're going to get the most readers or the most readers that are going to appreciate what you're doing, which is not the same thing. And, and also kept the most latitude to do everything that you want. These are complicated questions. There's really more that I can go into here. But I, like I'm reading now the, the, the novels about Henry VIII by Hilary Mantel. So that's historical fiction. And a, a decade ago, I was reading Patrick O'Brien's novels about the Napoleonic um, Naval War, um, and the Aubrey Matron novels, they're called. That's also historical fiction. These are beautiful novels. This is a, what's happened is that in modernism, domestic realism was the only real thing. and Everything else was a despised paraliterature. So if you did even historical fiction, you were doing this second-rate crap. And a science fiction, even worse. Might as well have been comic books. Well, in postmodernism, there's no condescension. There's no position of superiority left. Anything can be great if you do it, including graphic novels, comic books, movies, uh, superhero novels. I mean, anything could possibly be great. And in fact, we often see great work in all the genres, now that this, um, this bad moment of cultural snobbery is over. But there's residuals. There's still a residual snobbery. And snobbery comes out of insecurity. It's people thinking, I need to feel I'm superior to others because uh, secretly I feel like maybe I've got a problem. Got to get over it. You know, the, the New York Times, they got to get over it. The, the whole New York literary establishment, they got to get over it. This feeling that, that oh my god, and unless I'm a snob, I can't prove that I'm good, is a, is a terrible, crippling, stupid response. So uh, you, you talk a little bit about your creative process in terms of research. I was curious about the actual act of sitting down and writing uh, in, in your day to day. So if you could elaborate a little bit about how that uh, works for you, how, how you sure. get your books yeah. written. Well, I must tell you, I've been writing, uh, and I've been writing full time, not counting. Well, it really means always part time because of uh, being Mr. Mom and bringing up my kids. But I've been writing a lot, let's put it that way, for 40 years. And about 10 years ago, I was burning out. And I was thinking, you know, I'm tired of this. I can't stand to sit down and write anymore. 
But what I discovered by some experimentation, but what I was tired of was sitting indoors on my butt in front of a screen. And I moved my operation outdoors into my uh, front courtyard under a tree so I can see the laptop screen in the shade. And now being up in Davis, you know, it's somewhat like here. It's, we're really in, a, in the northern end or the back end of a Mediterranean climate. I do it every day of the year. I write outside. If it rains, I put a tarp overhead and the rain falls around me. It's like a bead curtain. It's kind of great because I'm still writing. If it's hot, I have a fan, I have a mister. The heat is by far the worst. If it's cold, I gear up in my snow camping gear and feel like I'm on a little adventure. You know, I've got a down hood on and gloves. And I'm thinking, man, I'm not just writing anymore. I'm having a little adventure. And it has rejuvenated me. And I will point to Galileo's Dream, 2312, and Shaman as the three books that have been done entirely outdoors using this method. And um, I think I'm on a hot streak, and it's not coincidental. It has to do with feeling like it's fun again, the actual uh, physical act of writing. Because as you know, everybody who does the kind of work we do, it's labor intensive. It's time intensive. You end up spending, I would reckon maybe uh, five hours per page, 500 pages. I don't even want to do the math on that. So that's what I do. And when I write first drafts, I can only go a half a day. When I'm revising, I can go all day and more. And the last thing is I decided recently that I would write every day of the week. I used to do it like a, I'd call it, be like carpentry. There's nothing mystical about it. I'd work Monday through Friday, take the weekend off with my family, get back to it Monday morning. A um, couple of few years ago, I decided to work on Saturdays and Sundays. And you have seven-fifths more time. And you never lose your train of thought. And you can get on streaks, uh, sort of a Cal Ripken streak, where like, it'll be a Sunday, and I won't have written. And it's like Sunday bedtime. I'm thinking, oh my god, I can't break my streak. So I have what I call the Cal Ripken moment, and I write 20 minutes. And, I, and so I've written that day. And sometimes it's a very good 20 minutes uh, of work. And then I just put it aside, and then I'm still on my streak. I've had streaks of you know, 260 days in a row. Uh, and right through Christmas Day, right through anything that might possibly uh, disturb it, I've written through. So that's my method now. And it hasn't always been that way, but it is now. And it's making me happy. My wife thinks I've gone crazy. Uh, she takes pictures of me you know, out in the rain and, and laughs her head off. But um, she can see that I'm happier, you know, that, I'm, that I'm on a streak here. And so I'll do, I, I thought I was near the end of my run, but I think I'll do a few to several more novels. And then I'll write my Sierra Nevada book. And that will be my retirement project. And I'll change again. So you said uh, basically a lot of research went, to, went into rice and salt and kind of uh, having kind of studied uh, the, the Middle Eastern part of that culture kind of rather, uh, not exhaustively, but uh, in a rather deep way, I can confirm that uh, you really did a good job there. I cannot say much about the Chinese or the Native American parts, that's, that, but that's really something. But does, I mean, you said that got you kind of exhausted and then your new pattern of working outdoors. So can we, is it kind of, how do you ask this? Um, are, are you saying you're not going to take on such kind of large projects anymore? I mean, because that, that's probably my favorite. I mean, well, thank you for that. And that, I mean, that one, there is a big uh, Persian moment in that one or um, um, Iranian, whatever you want to say. Um, this, this uh, once you have the uh, Europeans out of the picture, everybody else uh, has a better chance to express their culture. And, uh, and, and Persia is an ancient and powerful and beautiful culture. So that was one opportunity that I had. And, and one of my teachers was um, Iranian living in the United States of, of the, the, that part of the novel, that strand. So that was a great opportunity. And that is a single novel. It's just that at 900 pages long or whatever, it was um, uh, I'm not going to um, uh, uh, avoid anything. Uh, if I have an idea for another long novel, I will curse and gnash my teeth. It will be a disaster. But I won't run away from it. But I'm sort of thinking it won't happen. Uh, and if it turns out to be a long novel, the one thing I will avoid is trilogies. What I want to do is crush things into one volume. Yeah. And I, I want to claim that I've only done two trilogies, that the one that they call the California Trilogy is more of um, a triptych or a kind of a peculiar trio of books that isn't a story that begins and takes three volumes to take place, because those are three different novels. So I've done it twice. 
and the Washington DC trilogy was possibly a, you know, a bad idea. Uh, and now I'm working at about this length and I'm thinking there's not any, I don't see any ideas on the horizon that should take more than this length to do the job. So uh, I'll still do the research. I still have some kind of horrifying problems to solve in the novels that I have coming next. Formal problems, research problems. But I'm going to keep them all to one volume if I can. That's for sure. Thank you. And I want to thank Kim Stanley Robinson for joining us. Thank you, guys.